Okay, guys, so we are going to first talk about um, the Kingdom Protista, but just the algaes. Um, and we're going to go through the taxonomy and the, um, the different specimen in this PowerPoint. Um, and I know we've been doing the same thing in our lecture, so a lot of this should be um, overlap. But again, um, this might dive a little bit more into specific organisms for you. So let's first start with that uh, taxonomy. So we are in the domain Eukarya, or that um, our protists are eukaryotes. So they will have a nucleus. They will have membrane-bound organelles, things like a Golgi body and ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum. Um, they are those type of cells. Um, they are in the kingdom Protista, which is sort of like this junk drawer category. Um, it's for all of the organisms that aren't plants, aren't fungus, aren't animals, aren't prokaryotes, um, but they don't have really one defining trait. Um, maybe the fact that they don't fit somewhere else is that trait. So that we divide um, our um, king. Oh, let's go back. We divide our um, taxonomy then into super groups, right, in between domain and kingdom. And there are six of those. And again, we're just going to be focusing on the algae uh, today. So we won't focus on every super group today. Um, and again, like we said, they are the misfits. Um, you can have a plant-like protist, an animal-like protist, or a fungus-like protist. And today, again, plant-like only. When we look at protists, um, we know they have supergroups. But if we want to just put them into two big categories, we can say that there are plant-like protists. They are autotrophic. They make their own food via photosynthesis. And then the second big group is everything else. So animal-like and fungus-like protists are heterotrophs. They have to ingest their food. When we talk about those autotrophic protists or plant-like protists, what we're talking about are algae. Algae are not plants, they are protists. Algae are going to make up um, phytoplankton along with cyanobacteria. And phytoplankton is really the basis of our Earth's food web, um, especially in aquatic environments. They're going to produce at least 50% of the Earth's oxygen. Um, depending on the source you read, it goes anywhere from 50 to 80% of the oxygen on our planet being made by plankton. Um, they are grouped by their photopigments. So what um, pigment do they have to capture light to do photosynthesis? And they are rather diverse in their morphology or their body form. Uh, they can be unicellular, filamentous, colonial, or multicellular. So let's start with the supergroup Archeplastidia, which is our green algae and our red algae. A trick that I have to remember that green and red algae are in Archeplastidia is I look at plastid and I think of chloroplast and then I sort of think of plant cells um, and plants are green. So if that helps you to remember green algae is an archaeplastidia, um, great. Please go with that because um, we focus a lot more on the green algae than red algae, though they are both in this same group. Um, so let's first start with some general characteristics. Green algae are unicellular, filamentous, or colonial. So it takes on many different forms. 
Uh, genetically, they are pretty similar to land plants. They share a lot of the same genes. And we do think that our carophyte green algae is the precursor to land plants. Um, they have cell walls made out of cellulose, which is a lot like a land plant. Uh, they have photosynthetic pigments of chlorophyll A and B, like land plants, and they store their food as starch, just like our land plants. The first specimen that we're going to be looking at is our cladidomomas. Um, you're going to be able to watch some videos um, on the D2L. Um, and when we look at the cladidomomas, we'll see that they are unicellular, so single celled. They are motile or they're able to move. Um, and they do that using two flagella. If you look at the very top picture of the slideshow, um, the contrast on that microscope, um, you can sort of see two little stringy things coming off of that organism. Um, that's the flagellas. It has what we call a pyranoid region um, where their uh, starch is going to be made and stored. And it also has a stigma or an eye spot that helps it sense light. And um, the reason that that is such an important um, adaptation is that um, these guys are doing photosynthesis and they want to be in optimal light to do that. So they want to, um, you know, be closer to the surface of the water where there's sunlight. They want to not be shaded by other organisms so that stigma helps them to be in the sunlight. Um, let's move on then still in Archaeplastidia but to Spirogyra which is a filamentous green algae and basically that just means one cell is sort of stacked on top of each other in like a long thin filament looking structure. Um, it's, it's stringy. And we find Spirogyra in um, fresh water, in like running streams, cooler water, mountain uh, stream kind of areas. It has um, this mucilage layer, which makes it feel very slippery and helps it from drying out. Um, and it undergoes something called alternation of generations which we will spend a lot of time talking about when we talk about land plants. Um, but basically that is a strategy um, of reproduction where our haploid organism will grow into something um, as well as our diploid organism grows into something, um, which again will make a lot more sense as we learn about plants. Um, but what we should know about Spirogyra with this is that in the summertime, those filaments, that stringy, slippery green algae is haploid or 1N. It has half the number of chromosomes. In the fall, two of those filaments will sort of join up. We call it conjugation. Um, and they're able to then exchange their DNA and make a diploid zygote. So now we've combined DNA, we have a total uh, number, not half the number of chromosomes. Basically in the winter, those uh, diploid zygotes, that 2N zygote just chills out, it hibernates. Um, but then during spring, when the weather warms up, um, that zygote will go through meiosis, which will half its number of chromosomes. And now we make those filaments that are haploid again. Um, so pretty much um, we're growing uh, filaments that are haploid and zygotes that are diploid. Um, but we'll spend more time uh, in the future on alternation of generations if that's not making total sense right now. Okay, we also have uh, Volvox in our Archaeplastidia. And Volvox is a colonial organism, which means that each 
of its cells could live independently. Um, but when they are together in that hollow sphere, they're living and working as, as a team. And um, they want to arrange themselves in sort of this single layer uh, towards the outside um, so that they can get sunlight to do photosynthesis. When it's time to reproduce, those uh, cells that are inside of that sphere um, will sort of grow larger um, and, and basically dissolve that outside uh, mucousy capsule that they're in, um, and then the individual cells are able to break off and be their own colony. Red algae, we're not going to look at any specific specimen of that, um, but some key points we should know, they're mostly multicellular and they're macroscopic, which means that we could see them without a microscope. They're going to grow in temperature or in temperate to tropical marine or salty ocean environments. Their cell wall is made up of two compounds, cellulose and agarose, um, which is slightly different than land plants. They have um, some different photosynthetic pigments as well. They have phycobilins, which is what gives it its red color, um, on top of having chlorophylls. And they do store their food as starch. Okay, moving forward, um, looking at our supergroup SAR. And if you remember from lecture, that stands for stramiopiles, alveolates, and rhizarians. Um, and we're gonna loop, group them together um, to look at our brown algae, diatoms, dinoflagellates, and ciliates. Uh, so our brown algae is going to be marine. It is going to be filamentous or multicellular. At this point, uh, we do not have any unicellular or colonial brown algae that we know of. Um, and their cell walls are also made of cellulose. And they're going to contain a special uh, pigment called fucoxanthin. And they store their sugar in a, a different way. They store it as laminarin. So let's first look at um, a stramiopile that we call fucus. Fucus is um, also called rockweed. It grows in intertidal zones. So think like a rocky ocean coast where there are tide pools. That's where you'll find this. Because of that, they have what is called a hold fast. It's not roots like a plant, um, but it is a way to anchor it to the rocks it grows on. Um, and it is multicellular. You can see in the pictures right there. Um, and if you look carefully, you'll see these sort of engorged bubble structures um, on the tips and on the sort of blade of the fucus. And those are called conceptacles. And um, basically those conceptacles are going to hold um, eggs, we call that the oogonia, um, or the antheridia uh, conceptacles are going to hold sperm. So these conceptacles are for reproduction. What will happen is that the fucus, when it is ready to reproduce, it will release the sperm uh, into the water. It'll land on uh, the ugonia, fertilize the egg, and now we can make more fucus. Also, um, astramiopile is sargassum. Uh, and you can see here that we're looking at the sargassum. It's also called gulf weed. It's very, very common to find this washed up on the beaches here in South Carolina. Um, if you're walking along like Isle of Palms or Folly or on Sullivan's Island and you see like brown algae, th this is it. Um, and it has these little air bubbles in it 
to help keep it floating because it is going to be found in the open ocean, basically the middle um, of our um, Northwest Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and we call that area the Sargassum Sea. And really this is a incredibly important habitat um, because many, many animals are going to use it as a place to hide, to find food, um, including, you know, fish and sharks, but also things like sea turtles um, and, and even like seagulls and pelicans that can fly that far will, will utilize this Sargassum Sea area. So it's been called sort of an oasis in the ocean. Next in our stramiopiles is our laminaria, which is also called kelp. It is one of the largest algae species, can be meters in length. Um, it is used to make organic acid, which is used as a thickener in food and uh, cosmetic products. Its cell walls also have this mucilage layer in it, which helps it from drying out when it's out of water. And then uh, macrocystis and laminaria are going to be um, what makes our kelp forest off the west coast of the United States. Okay, also Australia pile are our diatoms. Uh, diatoms are one of my favorite protists. They're so beautiful to look at under a microscope. Um, so unfortunately you don't get to do that today, um, but we can see lots of pictures and videos of them. Um, and you may have something in your house right now, diatomaceous earth. Many people use it as a pesticide um, that's made of diatoms. Diatoms are single-celled or unicellular, and their shell or their test is made out of silicon, um, which is also a huge component in, in making glass. So um, it's why often sand is, is made into glass. Um, and then each daughter cell, like when it's time to reproduce, will receive half of that test. So you can think of um, their shells fitting together like a box. And you can take the lid off and then you have the base of the box. Um, well, then a new base or lid would, would grow. And that's how our diatoms reproduce. And these make up a large component of our phytoplankton in uh, watery environments. Okay, now we're moving to a different supergroup, uh, alveolates, still under SAR if we, if we group them together. Um, but if you remember from lecture, an alveolate has these little air um, bubbles underneath their um, their outer membrane. Um, so the alveolate we're going to look at is a dinoflagellate. All of these are single-celled or unicellular. They are made up of cellulose plates and they have two flagella to move. One of them is transverse or goes around their body sort of to help them spin on an axis. Um, and the other is called the longitudinal flagella that helps them like swim forward. Some of them are bioluminescent. Um, you may have seen some news articles um, or reports um, from California where people are surfing and swimming at night and it, it's these blue waves um, that's caused by these dinoflagellates. Uh, but even here in South Carolina, if you go to the beach um, at night, you would be able to uh, go up to like where the ocean water is, rub your hand on the sand, and you would see blue and green sparks. So they are here, just not as concentrated as they are in California right now. They do make up a large portion of our phytoplankton. Um, but there are some special um, dinoflagellates that, that we should know about. Um, the first are our zooxanthellae. 
Zooxanthellae live in a symbiosis with coral. So they actually live inside of the coral. Um, and it's, it's great because they're given a nice safe home in the coral. The coral use them to do photosynthesis. Um, but we're very interested in the Zooxanthellae um, dinoflagellates because when corals are under stress, um, they bleach. And that bleaching is that they um, lose the zooxanthellae. They lose their dinoflagellates. And if it's under a little stress, um, maybe there's a little bit of, of, you know, sea level rise or the water warming or nutrient overload, then, you know, there is evidence that that zooxanthellae can come back and, and be back with the coral. Um, but if it's a major stress for a long period of time, those zooxanthellae um, are expelled from the coral and they do not come back and then the coral will die. Um, there are also dinoflagellates, uh, specifically a species called Karenia brevis that causes red tides. Um, and that is just a huge bloom or a whole bunch of these uh, dinoflagellates in um, one area and they they can have some neurotoxic effects. So they um, basically poison um, wildlife. They, they don't allow for there to be oxygen in the water column. So we'll see the death of fish um, and, and manatees and turtles, but also it causes respiratory illness for, for humans living near the coast. And we find this very often um, on the Gulf co Coast of Florida, though it could happen anywhere that there is a large um, algal bloom. Okay, let's move on to our uh, supergroup Excavata, uh, where we're going to look at euglenoids, specifically euglena. Euglena is unicellular. It lives in fresh water, and it is going to swim using a flagella. On the outside of it, it has a protein pellicle, which is just uh, this protein membrane that, that gives it protection, but it's still, you know, a flexible membrane. Um, just like cladidomomas, um, euglena have an eye spot or a stigma that helps them to be able to do photosynthesis in the most efficient, best way. Um, but something unique to euglena is that they are photoheterotrophic. Um, and what that means is that they, they can have chloroplasts and do photosynthesis, um, but they can also eat and ingest things, um, potentially if there's not enough sunlight or if there is food source readily available. Um, and some are even saprophytic, which means that they are decomposers. They'll um, eat dead stuff. Okay, guys, so that's it for our algaes. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me, you know, discussion posts, emails, um, the Remind app. Um, and again, this information, as well as all of our resources um, and videos, are where you're going to want to find the info to um, complete your worksheet. Other than that, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. Thanks for watching.